and welcome back to the channel. <coughs> I would like to talk a little bit today about one other aspect of the Georgia model, namely the decoration. And I see there that the first officer is inspecting the decoration on this particular model of the ship. Let's hope that he approves it for God help us if he does not. But there are a number of things that are remarkable in this. Ships have always been heavily decorated. This was, well, perhaps not always, but uh, from early on uh, we have written records of sometimes not so much associated with the hull itself, but with heraldry, heraldry flags, shields, etc. in medieval times decorated the sides of the vessels, implying who is aboard. Subsequently, this moved to the rather geometrical style of decoration of the later 16th century, characteristically depicted in elements of English shipwrightry, which is currently held in the Pips Library in uh, Modeling College in Cambridge. But originally it is believed to have been the Matthew Baker manuscript, uh, one of the foremost shipwrights during the Tudorian period in England. And then, of course, by the 17th century, we have the full-blown, heavy, incredible decoration of the Baroque period. To me, that is probably the most beautiful period. Vessels were decorated heavily with carvings. And different, although all navies used carved decoration, sometimes quite heavily, from figurehead through the sterns, especially the sterns, it did vary from nation to nation. And uh, the English style was usually gilded rather than painted, with the exception of the royal coat of arms. In France, everything was gilded, mostly, as far as we can tell. But the Dutch, for example, preferred natural colors. So all their carvings on their vessels are painted the way you would uh, see on Baroque paintings of this period. Different styles, different ways. But why was decoration such an important element? This is a period in which the majority of people are illiterate. They cannot read the newspapers. They do not have Fox News or CNN to tell them what to think. They have to have some other way of um, passing on to them the information of what the upper class, what the governmental class wants them to understand, wants them to know. The Navy is, or always has been, a uh, tool of power. And even more specifically, it is a way of projecting power. The decoration was not so much to glorify the king, it was to threaten to intimidate the potential opponents of the king. We may find it hard to accept, hard to believe, but the truth of the matter is that the glory, the individual glory of a ruler did have a repercussion for the glory and the power of the state. Because few put it quite as crudely as uh, King Louis XIV of France, but the truth of the matter was that the king was the state, in one form or another. That was true even in a parliamentarian monarchy as England became throughout the seven, in, in the duration of the 17th century. So these carvings are not there just to be pretty and to see, oh, we have the artists to do it. They actually are always telling you a story. Uh, they are going to have um, Roman emperors. This is what you're going to see on the big head of Vasa. They are going to have lion heads on the gun ports. This is a message. In the one case, it is telling you, me, the owner of the ship, the king, or the state, is the equal of the great Roman emperors of the past. We are that powerful, we are that strong, we are that dangerous. Do you really, really want to tangle with us? The Navy is a form of projection of power over great distances. So this is essentially what the Navy is telling us. The carvings, the decoration is telling us about the might of the state, about the dominance of the state. It is a political statement. It is not just something pretty on which we're going to spend unnecessary amounts of money. It was quite necessary because this is how you communicate to the general masses. 
look at our might, look at our strength. This is the one thing, the images, the allegories, the allegorical depictions of these carvings and subsequently paintings on the vessels is what is talking to the masses who would not be able to read a broadsheet or a publication, but are perfectly in this period aware of traditional depictions of Roman soldiery, of mythology, of religious symbology. All of this is the common language for the general public. And it is also a lingua franca because the mythological figures, the religious figures, they are the same for pretty much all of Europe. Therefore, regardless whether you understand the language of the people who build these ships, you certainly understand the message. And that message is supposed to be mostly threatening message. And that is why ships in this period are so heavily decorated. So much is spent on them, even more so than uh, the cost of the uh, ship uh, themselves. The Royal Sovereign is an excellent example. By the end of the 17th century, uh, in the turn of the 18th century, however, the sheer cost has come out of proportion to everything else. Also, this is a period in which the navies are growing in power immensely. In, uh, they're growing in numbers. They are larger numbers of ships are needed. And if each one of these vessels is so heavily carved, and since ships engaged regularly in battles all the way until the second half of the 18th century, you would expect them to be heavily damaged. So you have to replace not only uh, to repair the damage, but you have to replace also the decorations and the sculptures on the vessels, which cost even more money to maintain. Of course, the navies and uh, in England, specifically the Navy board, who were in charge of the material side of uh, the Navy, became fully aware that for the cost of maintaining this decoration, they can build another cruiser. So in 1703 was the first major reduction in carving. There was an order in court uh, issued to the dockyards to limit the decoration of the vessels only to the bow, that is to say the figurehead, and to the stern of the vessel. But decoration from the sides of the ship was supposed to disappear. That the order was not immediately accepted, liked, appreciated or actually followed is quite clear by the necessity to repeat this order and decision. But gradually we do see diminution in the carvings and yet of course people wanted to continue sending exactly the same messages. And this is where a different style of decorating vessels began to emerge. While carvings would not completely disappear, especially in the transom area of the vessel, carvings would remain part all the way really until the introduction of the horrifyingly ugly Napoleonic period uh, stern to wit, look at the stern of uh, victory nowadays. But even there, there are some carvings, they just are quite limited. So this is the one area where we would retain carvings throughout the 18th century in the Georgian period. And of course, the other one, which is missing on this model still, the figurehead. But what do you do with the sides? What do you do with the frieze right above the gun ports? And in the uh, Georgian period, in the 18th century, this is when we begin to see paintings and decoration. In this case here, one of the most popular such ways of depicting and decorating vessels was, of course, the grape wines and uh, floral decoration throughout the length of the vessel. But towards the quarter deck, in the upper panel, and usually also quite often on the counter in the stern, we see paintings of uh, triumphs, of uh, arms, drums, captured flags, guns, cannon were depicted. And this is what you see, of course, on the friezes here, this model of uh, Pegasus that the sister channel is producing, building at the moment. It's going to be a rather nice model. I have to say that although my personal preference will always be the 17th century, for a variety of reasons that one day I might address in a different video, there is a certain elegance in the simplicity of the decoration of the middle 18th century, in the so-called classical Georgian period model, 
representative of which is this. This most unfortunately begins to die out during the French Revolutionary Wars. And again, it is the exigencies of the service, the exigencies of a long, heavy, hard-fought war that causes this drop in even this simple decoration. The, quite often the decorations were also a matter of taste of the captain. Although the Navy issued uh, certain quantities of paint and uh, other materials to maintain the ship and preserve it, captains were perfectly at liberty to um, stick their hand in their own pockets and buy goldly, buy additional colors, hire masters to decorate the vessels in accordance with their taste. The only established things that they could not really change was the figurehead, which for most of the 18th century was a simple lion, rather than individualized uh, figureheads towards the end, towards the Napoleonic period, or rather the French Revolutionary Nap and Napoleonic periods, we begin to see individual figureheads uh, that again have something to do with the name of the vessel, usually. And that is something that uh, for most of the 18th century is really characteristic of the larger rates, victory, first rate ships, uh, the line, second rates, they would have individualized figureheads. The smaller rates would have to be satisfied with the lion, something that comes out from even 17th century. Why lions? It is quite obvious. They are the kings of the jungle, they are powerful, they are noble, they are uh, dangerous beasts and do you really want to tangle with them? They are symbols of royal power since at least the Bronze Age, if not earlier. So that is the context in which we see in the Georgian period these beautiful friezes painting. There is a certain really warm attraction, at least to my eyes, rather jaundiced and prejudiced eye. I do like the friezes and I really do not like the Nelsonian checker board decoration of the vessel. But I've always said that I should have been born in a different century. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to seeing you on another another video in uh, on the channel and if you have any questions i'll be delighted to address them thank you so much for watching goodbye